Good evening. My name is Joe Geiger, and I'm the director of Archives and History, and I'd like to welcome you to the Archives and History Library, and thank you very much for, for coming out. We're, uh, we're truly honored with a great speaker this evening and a, a, a familiar name for Charles Stonekins, Mr. James. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to just touch on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, note a few upcoming lectures uh, that we have. On August the 5th, we'll have a, a professor, a history professor from Marshall University by the name of Dr. Kevin Barksdale, who will be talking about uh, the lost state of Franklin, which relates to Tennessee, but it relates to how West Virginia was formed, the creation of West Virginia background relating to sectionalism and things like that. Uh, another thing I want to note very quickly, and, and I, I'll have to run over to the computer to do that, uh, actually is, is the, um, the Hardin and Hardin funeral home records. I know Mr. Kinzer mentioned that at our last lecture, the fact that uh, Simpson Memorial uh, had those records uh, through the efforts of Mr. Henry Battle and Fred Armstrong, Mr. Kinzer, uh, a number of other folks. Uh, the trustees there donated those records to Archives and History, so they're here in our collections. And we just finished up uh, processing those records. We have a finding aid that I'm going to just quickly flash up on the screen so that you can see that. Uh, but we also created a database. Uh, it has actually 5,910 names of persons who uh, were buried by Hardin and Hardin, Hardin Gilmore, Scott Funeral Home, uh, and these records are here in the archives. So what we did today, Mary Johnson's around here taking pictures, actually Mary uh, exported that database and created an alphabetical listing of all of the names uh, of those persons whose funeral home records we have here in Archives and History. So I'm just going to flash that up on the screen real quick. If you want to find that, if the easiest thing to tell you to do is to go to, to google.com and type in West Virginia history, and we should be the first thing that comes up. If you come up to a page that says, Welcome, Archives and History, uh, then you'll note uh, over on the right-hand side, the very top thing will say Hardin and Hardin Funeral Home records are online. The finding aid is available. I forgot to mention also, and I'm sure Mr. Kinzer will note this, this is the second of the block lecture <coughs> series, and all that Mr. Kinzer talk a little bit more about what that is. Uh, and certainly, as I said, we're very honored to have Mr. James with us. I would also note that on August the 28th, Barbara Lacey, who's in attendance here this evening, uh, will be speaking. So we'll look forward to that, that third installment. So mark your calendars and come on out. I'm going to pop over here, just flash this up real quick, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Kinzer. As I said, if you go to our front page, this is what you'll see. Over on the right-hand side, you'll see this. It says Finding Aid for Hard and Hard Funeral Home Records. You click, and you can see the contents of that collection. But if you note know right there at the top, that link, if you click on that, that is that alphabetical listing that I was talking about. So if you happen to see someone and you want to see those funeral home records, you just come here to Archives and History. We'll pull those documents down, and you can look at the records themselves. Now Mr. Kent is going to get us started. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to see everyone here tonight. And I'm very pleased that the organization has moved into a direction that will archive and provide researchable material for individuals and in historic moments within the Charleston and Canal Valley area. Uh, we hope to expand at some, some point to include information outside of our area to encompass more statewide information. The organization, the West Virginia Center for African American Art and Culture, formed a committee called the Northside Historic Community Group that's been meeting for since 2009 to create a Charleston's first and only local historic district that encompasses 25 acres from Sense Street <coughs> to Capitol Street with Washington and uh, Smith Street as north and south boundaries. Within the 25 acres are five, <coughs> five sites on the National Register of Historic Places. One of our projects at later date is to provide 
readable and visual information about those historic sites for tourists and people who walk around the area and don't know those sites are on the register. They can look and read a piece of information that we hope to provide for them at some point in the future. But we have put historic and commemorative bricks in the sidewalk along Washington Street and Shrewsbury that would indicate three major points or locations of historic significance in the area. Those being the Ferguson Hotel has its own commemorative brick in the sidewalk, near Spurlock Alley and Shrewsbury Street. The Brown Building has its own commemorative brick around the corner of Shrewsbury Street. And the first, first Baptist Church across the street at the head of Shrewsbury Street. If you, take, if you have some time at some point to walk down Shrewsbury Street and take a look at those bricks and think about the history that those three locations represent around the area. But I want to uh, take notice of individuals who are here tonight that, who have helped me, and I mean helped me tremendously, take the organization into these directions that we're moving into. Particular board members who are here tonight is Ms. Corey Carter. Uh, would you stand, please? Mr. Casey James. I don't see it, but Mr. Tony Lee is a board member. Mr. Phil Barkey is a board member. Did you stand, Mr. Barkey? And the uh, Historic Preservation Society President, Henry Battle, and John Worley, and, and Rush Young have helped me in our organization tremendously do what, do what we're doing. I want to give them a lot of thanks for what we're going on. And this particular project, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I just want to say, since my face is new, uh, there's today's newspaper carries the obituary of Elizabeth Harden Gilmore, Jr. She's not a junior. The, the daughter of Elizabeth Harden, who was the Gilmore, who was the doyen of the funeral home. Her daughter died yesterday. And, and her service is at 1 o'clock Saturday at the Springfield, oh, at the Springfield Cemetery. Thank you, Henry. You were up here. But I, I want to give a lot of thanks to the organization that what we're doing now, the Block Speakers Series. And it's a, it's a, it's a project that we hope will be expanded in the, in the coming years. We have at this point our last speaker, Thomas Tyree. We have currently our current speaker, Cheryl J. III. Our next speaker in August will be Barbara and Lacey. But the purpose of the speaker series is to highlight the historic facts from individuals who have personal knowledge of the importance of history. I've been known to say, and I believe in my heart, that history is history, no matter whose it is. And someone has to document it. Someone has, someone has, to, someone has to record it. It doesn't matter who, but it has, it has to be done. We are doing our history. We're doing your history. We're doing Jewish history. We're doing Hispanic. We're doing everybody's history because we all have a connective point somewhere. You probably don't know where it is, but make it known to younger generations that there's a connective point to everybody's history. Finding it is the purpose of our organization and exposing it and highlighting that history. The Block Speaker Series has individuals that I hope to bring out that history. Personal experiences, family experiences, social and community experiences. Mr. James has a wonderful story to tell a family history that dates back to the 1700s, 1800s. In the annals of Charleston's history, and now in the annals of the world history, that, that has to be known to younger generations. We, as we listen to it and absorb the history that the Block Speaker Series put forth, can share that with other individuals. Whomever we choose to talk to and share that with. I hope you'll come to the next speaker series to listen to Ms. Barbara and Lacey. Uh, 
28th of August. Same time, same place. Tell you, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your schoolmates. It, bring, it brings me younger people with you. They have to know about the history here. And they have to know who the people are who have experienced it firsthand. They are very researchable information that can be done. Thanks to the Archives of History, the Hardy Gilmore records are available. Make use of those. But let me introduce our current speaker. I'm really happy to know his family. Uh, his, his mother is an avid researcher, so she has lots of information. And uh, I admire her for her researchable uh, ability. I admire her for her being the lady that she is. I admire her for her status in the community and what she has meant to the community of Charleston. And the family has a rich and wonderful history that Mr. James will make available to you now. So without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Charles H. James III. I'm home. Yeah. And then I looked at those hills today and I thought, wow, my family's been walking around these hills for a long time. So um, if it started out, it's called the mid 1700s, is how far back we traced to Virginia. But then, due to the oppression that free blacks faced in Virginia, like uh, you couldn't vote, you couldn't have guns, you couldn't. Uh, testify against white people if you went to the 7-Eleven, they could kidnap your children and sell them to slavery. So they decided that they would just go on across the river. You couldn't educate your children, and if you sent them out of state to get educated, they couldn't come back. So they went over to Ohio. And um, Ohio was where the first generation of the Jameses grew up that eventually settled in Charleston. And um, I guess I can say this because um, I'm not talking about me, but as I've had the opportunity to research the history of part of the family, there are just some very, very amazing things that, that I found. So for example, we'll talk about my great-grandfather who started our family business, and I'm always wondering, so how did he figure out to even do that? And then his father, Francis James, and we'll see him for a second, that. But, but Francis James's father is a guy named Hal James, and that's, that's my name as well. Um, they, I was just, I knew they lived in Gilead County, Ohio, and we're talking about doing the research. So I just started Googling James, Hell James, Gelly of the County, Ohio, underground railroad operators. So this is a whole thing, it's, it's called the search of hell. There's this whole story that they tell about that. So this is the house that they grew up in that I think stressed independence, it, it stressed intelligence, it, it uh, expressed wit, because uh, the underground railroad was not a uh, wide touch football. If you got caught with slaves, you would get killed. Uh, and he did it for, they did it for, four, for, uh, for 20 years, from 1840 to 1860. Um, so this is the Reverend Francis James, who is Hal James' son. And um, as I see Mr. Uh, Mr. McCabe, Senator McCabe, back in the back, he uh, is writing a book about several Charleston families. And one of the people that he mentions is uh, John P. Hale. And John P. Hale wrote a book called A History of the Trans-Allegheny pioneers, and he wrote a lot of the first in Charleston, and he said in his book that Francis James was the first pastor, minister of First Baptist Church. This was the first Baptist church for blacks, and he was the first minister there. And then uh, Anthony said that my mother does a lot of research, and we argue about this because I think that Hale said that he was the first school teacher of blacks, and mother said he's not. So we argue about that sometimes. But he, he, his name would be mentioned in, the, in, the, in that circle, so to speak. So, um, so that, so you heard it said, among, Negro first, among the first Negro teachers of Charleston were Reverend James and his sister, Miss Lucy James, who became the mother of J.F.J. Clark, president and principal of Garnet High School. Um, so then, um, we were also talking about funerals and funeral homes today. 
So uh, I can point out the Robinsons here who live on Quarry Creek. And you honor the development on the hill Quarry Creek. So when Tom Graff and those guys were developing it, they were getting ready to clear some stuff out. They came into a clearing, and all it was a graveyard. And all these graves were there. And then there was a big obelisk there, about this tall. And it's Francis James's grave. And, and all of his siblings, his children, were listed on, his, uh, on the obelisk. And so whenever I come to Charleston, I like to go up there from time to time. I have old Francis in my address book. <laughs> He's number 58 Quarry Creek behind uh, Dick Barber's house. So that's how I know how to find him. So I go to 58 Quarry Creek and ask, usually I pass Casey and I'm walking down the street and say, Casey, where's 58? And it's right up there. So again, a lot of history there. We, and, and my father, for example, grew up here his entire life and had no idea that it was there. When they found him in the Gazette, we went up there and took some pictures and we did not know that that was there. And this, actually, this is kind of fun because this has actually turned me into somewhat of a hobby for me because we have all these oral traditions about things that happened or didn't happen. And then you can start trying to piece the pictures, uh, piece the uh, puzzle together with actual facts. Um, so then, so Francis James had a son named C.H. James, Charles Howell James. And he came to Charleston, like his father, to be a school teacher. But as they said in certain articles and books, that he found the game, the game of trade far better for his interest. And he started out as a pack peddler. And you always like to say, um, in today's world, what's, what's your business model? His business model was, well, the coal miners don't have any money, but um, they still need stuff. Pots, pans, calico, things like that. So he lived in Charleston. He lived in Charleston, and so he would take pots, pans, and calicos out in the coal fields looking to make some money. But then he realized they got paid in strip. So what can he do with strip? So he thought about it, and he said, well, I can't take your strip, but I see grew some corn over there. I'll take that. I see grew some tomatoes over there. I'll take those. And he, he got into the produce business. So he would bring the produce back to Charleston and sell it to the grocery stores and restaurants, starting with a backpack. And that's how he started his business. And by this time, and that was in 1883. And so the reason I think about that is that, so he, he's going to progress from this picture. But how do you think that he could do that? And how do you think he could build a big business? What would, who was his role model for that, right? But I think about, he says in the letter, he says, I told somebody, he said, I was born in the state of Ohio and reared by my grandfather there. And his grandfather was Howell James, who was running the Underground Railroad. So you can imagine what those Sunday dinner conversations were like. It was not keep your head down and stay out of trouble, boy, and you know, don't let the white man see you. It's like, you can be whatever you want to be. I've been out with these folks for years, and you can do whatever you need to do. And I think that's where he got this spirit from. Um, so he continues with his brothers to build that. And then um, he, had a, he had a son, Herbert Roy, was his oldest son. And Ansela Bickley showed me an article one time, and I can't find it for the life of me, that showed when he died. He drowned in the, uh, in the, in the river. There was a whole article in one of the black newspapers of the time. And so that would have to be just tragic. Anybody losing their first son, their oldest son, I can't imagine um, how, what that would be like for him to go through. So, um, Hopefully you are seeing some familiar names and faces up here. So people are pretty much familiar with Garden High School. And so here is um, Edward E. L. James, class of 09, captain 07 and 08. So he was on the football team at, uh, at Garden. And then there's Charles Payne and the Summers and some other names that you probably recommend. Remember, he's GHS 07. So that was the Garden High uh, football squad back in the day. So then my great grandfather finally worked his way up from a backpack, backpack to a wagon. Then he found he needed some more space. So he opened the storefront on Summer Street. Now this building, it took me a long time to figure this out, is it's on Summer Street, north of Virginia, between Virginia and Canal Boulevard. That's, that's that block. It was like a parking garage is there right now. But that's where that is on 16 Summer Street. And that was in 1908. And this is my great-grandfather here. If 
you can see, very close to this C.H. James wholesale produce right there. This is my grandfather right there. So that's what 1908. So that's right around the same time he's playing football uh, for Vernon. And um, so then he had, so now he had established a storefront wholesale business that he was operating. Uh, I like his, uh, I like his, uh, his straw boater there, um, <laughs> style for him. Um, and then that's my grandfather, who Edward James, who um, was valedictorian at, at Garnet. And I like people like that. For example, Henry Worley was introduced at the Charleston Rotary Club one time. And they said, and Mr. Worley is a graduate of Princeton. I said, well, of course he is. Daddy got him in. And where he was, where he was, where he was graduated summa cum laude. Of a, Whoa! Okay, Daddy can't get you some. Daddy can maybe get you in the door, but he cannot get you summa cum laude. So, even though he's growing up in a very privileged way, he still was a very, very hard worker, and uh, ended up valedictorian. And he left, and he went to Howard University in Washington. So another tie there is my great grandfather who was very good friends with Mordecai Johnson, that may, many of you may know, who was another pastor at First Baptist Church, who left First Baptist Church to become president of Howard, and that's where he went to, uh, he went to school. Um, so this is the same place on Summer Street, although there's some more mule teams there. And somebody came to our office one time and said, those are mules. You all, mules are, court, are crosses between horses and donkeys. It's kind of a hybrid deal. But there, I guess people know about that. And you can see where he had C.H. James here. And then he actually lived above his store up here. If you can really see it, it says C.H. James 16 and a half. So his store was there, and they lived over the store. Um, fast forward 10 years or so, uh, business looks like it's improved. This is my grandfather getting married. Now, this is in Oberlin, Ohio. Um, and he was marrying a young lady named Stella Shaw. And there was an interesting piece of history that came to us just very, very recently about the Shaw family. So if you saw 12 Years a Slave, right? So when Patsy went on the porch to sit with the black lady who was the plantation mistress, that was her grandmother. That plantation owner's name was P.J. Shaw. And they, they had all these little mulatto children running around. And they come Daniel Webster Shaw, Thomas Jefferson Shaw, all these illustrious names. <laughs> so her father was Daniel Webster Shaw, who was the minister, served at uh, Simpson Memorial, Simpson, Simpson Methodist Church, for a number of years. And that's where she met my grandfather. That was only they hit it off because she came, they came back and, and got married. Uh, that's their wedding day in 1917. So now the business gets even better. So he decides he needs a um, bigger building. And that building still stands at Virginia Street and Park Avenue there. And um, that's his wholesale produce. And what you really can't see beside it is that he had his own rail car beside it. Um, that he would take straight truckloads, train car loads of produce in. And um, um, that's, that's the quantities that he dealt with. I only wish that he had gotten the Coca-Cola franchise. Thursday, <laughs> <laughs> say, if he had gotten Coca-Cola, it would be a different story than that. <laughs> so um, that's the building. So he built that building in 1918. And then this is something that I, this is new this year too. So growing up, my father had this letter in his den that I subsequently had restored from Theodore Roosevelt to my great grandfather. And it's a Roosevelt Hospital letterhead. And the letter basically says, my dear Mr. James, uh, of course I remember you. Was not there another colored fellow there as a colleague with you? He said, I must have spoken to you at least 100 times as the man who through actions rather than words is solving the race problem in this country today, your fellow American Theodore Roosevelt. So that's all I really knew. So his obituary, I'm going to let you all know they said he visited Theodore Roosevelt in the White House. And I don't think he did. <laughs> but the Daily Rail said he did. But he was associated with Theodore Roosevelt. And there's the letter to him. And so then, after I got the story, I kept thinking, that's clearly replied to a letter. And when Theodore Roosevelt was president, they didn't have um, presidential libraries. So a lot of the stuff is in the Library of Congress. So I got an idea. So I wrote the Library of Congress, just emailed them on the site. 
I said, uh, I have a question for you. Are you familiar with the letter Theodore Roosevelt wrote to C.H. James in 1918 that I have to have a copy of right here? <laughs> yes. And it's the original? And I said, it's so. I'd be curious about that. And it's clearly a reply to a letter. And if you would have any idea of what he was replying to, dear Mr. James, we were very well of that letter that he wrote. And we also have the letter that your great grandfather wrote to him. So, see, and then I like this too, because he has, you know, he's building on his letter here. So, oh, this is really funny right here. Okay, so people that are in business, his references were, were Dunn and Company and Bradstreet and Company. That's before Dunn and Bradstreet first. <laughs> so, um, so what happened is that he was a big ardent admirer of Theodore Roosevelt. He went to the Bull Moose Party Convention in 1918, and he was a delegate. And it was a big deal because the Republicans would just really send the worst of the worst black people to be delegates because they were, I mean, the Democrats went from the South. And the Republicans in the North wouldn't let him do it. And Theodore Roosevelt, was, who was very uh, progressive for his time, you know, he was the first president that had a black man dying in the White House, who was Booker T. Washington. So he was very progressive. And so he, um, he, um, he was giving some speeches there. And then he said, this is what we need. He says, just now, a colored fellow from West Virginia and a, he who had a colleague with him, these are men that are elected in their community, respected in their community, and stand equal to any white man in here. He said that to a speech on the floor of the Progressive Party in 1912, I believe it was. So he remembered him because he said, this is what we're looking for. It's like all the affirmative action stories today, right? Everybody said, well, I'd like to hire some black folks, black folks or women. We just can't find any that qualified. So we're not going to sacrifice our stance for quality. When we find a woman that qualified, we're going to hire them. That's what Theodore Roosevelt was saying. He said, we're not just going to bring people in here of color just bring them in here, but we know that there are people out there like that. And so that's what, so he mentioned him a couple times in the speech. So in 1918, Theodore Roosevelt gets very sick. And he goes to the Roosevelt Hospital. That's the letterhead right there. And um, which was a, his cousins had, had found that hospital. And so they actually thought that he died. There were some false newspaper reports. But slowly he worked his way back to recovery. And they, so I was reading about this before I even knew what was going on here, is that, that um, I placed him in the hospital at that time. And then he said he was getting tremendous correspondence from George Clemenceau, from, from, from Taft, from the King of England, and all this other kind of stuff. And he spent much of his time catching up on reading, I mean, catching up on correspondence with colleagues and friends. So he said he's getting bushel loads of letters. He replied to my great grandfather's letter. So you know he couldn't reply to every single one. Maybe he did, I don't know. But he replied, he said, of course I remember you. So I thought that was pretty um, amazing. So then, this is also in Charleston history, the National Encyclopedia of the Colored Race in 1919. Um, I'm telling you, he was on a roll in 1918, 1920. He was going pretty good. So, um, so they, here's his entry in there. And uh, it says, history centers around the name of C.H. James of Charleston, West Virginia. His father was a soldier in the Union Army. See, I can't find his father in the Union Army. So that's the kind of stuff that gets me. So I think you just go to um, Ancestry.com and look up the records of black soldiers, and there it'll be. I found a lot of black soldiers, but I haven't found him yet. But he also says that, of course, so that these are some of the things I just kind of fool around with on the, on the weekends. But um, then he said, um, Okay, in 1912, he was a delegate to the convention at Chicago to nominate Colonel Theodore Roosevelt on the progressive ticket. This is from the big events of his career, not only in politics, but being away so long and carefree from his business. So that's the way I kind of triangulated that. So where did he meet Theodore Roosevelt? Well, the progressive party convention would be the Bull Moose Convention, and he went there. He was a delegate there, and that's what Theodore Roosevelt said in his letter to him. I remember you well. Was not there another colored man as the, who was a delegate with you? So I think that's where they where, the, where they met. Um, so, but also in there, and I was talking to Anthony about this. Uh, Bird Prillman is in that encyclopedia. Mordecai Johnson's in the encyclopedia. I'm going to say at least Starks. I believe was the encyclopedia. I think there were like a half a dozen Charlestonians. Charleston 
play above the rim for its size. They really, they, there are some people that have come out of Charleston that Leon Sullivan is just Elliot Hicks, uh, oh, that, um, <laughs> that, uh, that it just really does some, some great things. And this is of a national uh, prominence, right? And so even Booker T. Washington was basically kind of out of Charleston and Malden in that whole area. And they were contemporaries um, as well. As a matter of fact, they had a thing called the National Negro Business League, which they went around trying to start black businesses. And he ended up being an executive officer uh, on that uh, as well. Now, remember Tulsa and Oklahoma and the race rise they had there? And then they had some letters. It's like, no, I don't think I'm going to make a convention in Tulsa this year. So there's things like that. But we did go to Chicago. Now, that's him, C.H. James, and that's his wife, Roxy Ann Clark. And they're from, her family's from Ohio, too. And there are a lot of very prominent African American families that have come out of Ohio. So somehow they made their way over. And you have Overland, this whole education tradition there. Um, and there are a lot of uh, ties there. And the Clark family, Dr. Ben Clark here. So they're all related. I'm related to Clarks through her. Um, so then he decided that this living above the storefront was getting to be a little cramped. So he thought he'd build him a house. And so that's the house that he built on Virginia Street. Unfortunately, it's torn down now. Um, now, this is his brother, Roy, who grew up in Charleston. I'm going to make a really long story short. Grew up in Charleston, found the racism in America a bit much, went to Europe, didn't like it. They went to Mexico. They didn't like it with my great grandfather. So then the guy said, you got to go to New Zealand. And so Howard James was a carpenter that lived in Ohio on the Underground Railroad part of thing. And said, so he inherited his father's skill with the tools. And he became a real estate developer in, um, in uh, Perth, no, that's, that's in uh, Australia, in Auckland, New Zealand. There, there are, so everything I'm telling you guys about right now, there are articles that back all this stuff up. And then they married somebody light-skinned over there and really light skin. And the next generation married really light skin. Y'all see where this is going. And so uh, my father has a cousin named Roy James, and that is Herbert Roy James. So he's taking C.H. James coming down the line. The Roy James is coming down the line. And so when I lived in Los Angeles, I had some cousins that had met them before because they lived in New Zealand. Then they went to San Paulo, Brazil. Then he comes to United States goes to school at UCLA, and he's very fair and straight, straight black hair. And he came over, talked to us, he was very, very nice about everything. And then I said, um, well, you know, my father's coming, why don't you come over? Why don't you bring your kids? Well, I think so. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, now where are they going to be at? Uh, Manhattan Beach. So his great grandchildren are white, are living with white women in Manhattan Beach. They don't even know what the deal is. So I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm keeping that to myself right now. But he basically said they, they crossed over their past, and their last name is still James. So I don't know if many of you all know Elliot does remember Miss Virginia Jarrett at uh, First Baptist. She was one of my favorite people growing up in that church. And of course, she was very, she was very old. And I said, Miss Jarrett. She said, yes. She said, um, I said, you were here when my great-grandfather was a member of the church. She said, yes. I said, well, tell me about him. She said, well, he was a, he was a choir master. He was on the trustee board. I said, what else? Well, he was a man that didn't stand for no nonsense. Now, looking at that picture, that's your boss? <laughs> I don't think he still for much nonsense. So, um, so then this is my great-grandfather -grand, great and my grandfather standing out in front of the building. In, uh, in the 1920s. This is one of their trucks, C.S. Jensen, produce, fruits, and supplies, wholesale vegetables. So again, that's all on the west side. I think this is my Aunt DeReef, but I love this license plate, West Virginia, 1920, and it's a Packard. So he's got his truck there, and you can kind of tell that's the side of the, uh, the building. Um, then, then in 1920, they decided to write an article about this magazine out of Pittsburgh, and there's a whole long story about how I finally was able to get this article out of Pittsburgh because he referenced that article in a letter that he had written. So you, I don't know, how many people do genealogical family research? Yeah, and you just see these like odd things like, okay, where's that coming from? Where, how do I tie that loop, okay? So that I knew that there was this um, article, but I'm not gonna go into that, but we found the article. And so 
It says, how C.H. James Jones from a pack peddler to the head of a quarter million dollar business. Snugly lying at the foot of Washington Hills is a sharp bend of the historic Canal River that lies the city of Charleston. The population is thriving, about 40,000, one-fifth of which consists of Americans of our group. In the light of our general progress, to say that the colored people of Charleston, as we were talking about earlier, um, what bonded us so they had a city school superintendent, two sanitary inspection officers, United States River Observer, three members of the state legislature, so forth, so forth, which is in itself is noteworthy. But then, uh, but then it's when it's learned that perhaps the most successful and significant effort of the colored man as a competitor in the great field of business is found in this West Virginia city. Uh, oh my. Then he says, ask, this is what I like, ask any person of our group who you chance to meet them on the streets of Charleston of C.H. James, and you will see a countenance light up, the awakening of racial pride and appreciation is evident. Next sentence. Every man, woman, and child is proud of this company and its business. Likewise, ask any representative white man the same question, and strange to say, he too seems proud of this particular Charleston. And so, um, again, Brooks was talking about some of these things that he belonged the Chamber of Commerce, they weren't going to let him in. They didn't let him in AAA, believe it or not. But some of the other, the Produce Smith Association, and he talks about this. And this is actually really amazing because I didn't find this until after I was out of college. But he quotes, so it's like I'm sitting down there talking to him. He gets interviewed in this article. He's talking about the embracing the name of the magazine as the competitor. So when he squared up and built that building and had real power, they had, he had to come to the table. This is not a man that could be ignored. Um, this was one of his company cars. This was his balance sheet in 1927. This is, this is Roy James again, uh, who we spoke of earlier, who went down to New Zealand and never came back. Um, this, is, this is my grandfather in the 1920s. I guess he's styled around a little bit right there. Neither of those women look like my grandmother. I was before, to his players card up at Howard. Now, 1929, C.H. James dies. This is the front page of the Charleston Daily Mail. And on the front page of the paper is C.H. James dies in his home here. So forth so and they have this whole article about him. And I think that that, again, shows the respect that he commanded uh, in his city. And there were editorials <coughs> about him, what a great citizen he was, and no efforts undertaken with that, consulting him and a couple other of these people. So um, that was that. So now. This is where things get really tough. So you have my great grandfather built this business from nothing. My grandfather grows up following the curve, right? So he's got, they both have Pierce Earl limousines. And I don't know if you all really noticed that, but the way you can tell a Pierce Arrow because of the way their headlights go. And that was a rival to Cadillac, to Rolls Royce, and everything. And that's what they were driving in those days. And then in 1929, my great-grandfather died, and later that year, the firm went bankrupt. Um, and I, my father said he would ask his father, and, he, and it, was, it was the cycle. He said, well, I couldn't pay my bills because my customers couldn't pay me. And Noy Brooks, Noyes, Noyes Hubbard, and all those names are there, and the, the Noyes, P.H. Noyes, all those company names, and Brooks has done a lot of research on this, are popping up in his papers, and they're coming in for the kill for the, uh, for the bankruptcy. So, while a lot of Wall Street brokers from Princeton were jumping out of windows, there's another story I can't really quite get it, but a guy came up to me on father one time, he said that his father sold my grandfather a Ford truck on credit, and he started his business again from scratch. They lost the house, they lost the building, and everything, and just devastated, in the Great Depression, with what? Seven children. <laughs> now, that's when they moved um, to Institute. And I will also say this. Every single one of them graduated from college. Betsy was a school teacher. Dereeth was, uh, well, she did it the old school way. She went to Fisk and got her nursing degree, but kind of ended up falling in love with the dentist. And so she moved to San Francisco. Edward, my father's older brother, went to Ohio State. Grace became Dr. Grace James. She was a pediatrician for many years in Louisville. And then this is Harriet, she was a school teacher, and that's my father. And then that's his um, brother, uh, Daniel, who was also, I believe, an engineer, went to the University of Illinois and started practicing for a while. 
So in spite of all this, they still had seven children and put them out. Then that's, they're starting to build up. Now this is on Patrick Street here in the 40s. And then there was an article about how they kind of did this whole thing. And then this is in 57. We're getting close, people. Um, my father comes back into the business. My grandfather is there. And Edward is there. And I like my uncle Edward, but I always tell people, see, this is, this is the difference between Ivy League and Ohio State. But, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, so, but now, meanwhile, like, like there used to be an old saying that says, not all black people know each other, but all black people that can read do, right? So, I don't know how I got up in Philadelphia, but they're supporting it in white tie. And that's my grandfather here and my grandmother. And they're evidently enjoying the fruits of his labor after he worked his way out of the um, depression, put seven kids through college. Then some of the fruits of the trucks on Summer Street, I mean on Patrick Street. And then that, that um, is uh, right after um, my uncle was in the war, my father's a picture of the kids. So then in 1963, Ebony has an article, Western Family Produce Family. James has operated business since 1883. So they, they go on to talk about all this type of thing. I'll look at this next page. Ebony Mac, wow, burn hands, white flesh, really? <laughs> really? That's like that, a headline. These were, and so that was one of the things that was, I always found very interesting because most black businesses came out of the black community. So you would have a restaurant for black folks. You would have a hotel for black folks. And they never did that. And never has black people comprised more than one, two, three percent of our customer base. But what I like about that is it says this. It says, well, so I was asked to join Edgewood Country Club in um, the late 80s. And I actually went ahead and joined. And uh, then they started to get to thinking. And they said to my father, well, would you like to join? He's like, I know you got 30 years, you're just getting around to ask, no thank you. But I will come, I will come and need a Chuck's tab and smile at you. I am not joining this club, right? So what that, and, and was, this is actually Charleston as well. And I wish I could remember the exact guys that brought me in, but they said, Chuck, you ought to join Edgewood. And I said, really? They said, yeah, it's nice for the kids, they can play tennis, they can play golf, you know, you can have dinners here, things like that, lots of entertaining facilities. They said, well, yeah, but you know, they don't let black people in. And they said, oh, well, that's about to change because we need to change. And our parents are telling us to join. And if they don't let you in, we're not joining either. So OK. So they put me up, and I was accepted into the club. Now, what that tells me about them, though, is this, is that we will not socialize with you. We will not have you to our home. We will not ask you to join our club, but I will do business with you. I will, and that's a pure, my great-grandfather competition. That's, that's a pure price, quality, service, game. Because lines were drawn. And, uh, and as, as Anthony was saying, because he wanted me to talk about my experience, but I only talked like the last two years of segregation, so I couldn't really speak to my experience, but I can speak to what they went through. Um, once again, my father, uncle, then that's my grandfather. Now that's his home institute. And then that's the family reunion they had. And then this is my father down in Dunbar. He built this warehouse in Dunbar in the 1970s. When I say you can tell it's the 1970s because he had his leather. You know, <laughs> and there's a picture of my great grandfather he had on his wall. Um, and then that's when I joined the uh, management training program in 1985. And portraits of my grandfather, great grandfather, there. Um, and then my father and I in our warehouse. And then that was, uh, so then in 1976, oh, this is a good one. 1970. Four, the first black enterprise, BE100, came out. And C.H. James was nowhere on the list. And so my father call, called Earl Graves and said, um, I think that we should be on the list. And he said, well, send your financials. Nobody ever thought to look at West Virginia since there was black businesses there. <laughs> Next year, he was 50 on the BE100 list. And then two years later, he was company of the year. Now, I was able to achieve a similar honor in 1992 when we were company of the year, and that's the uh, picture that they took for that article. And then that's my father and I in uh, 1992 in his den. So 
hopefully you all saw some pictures that you can relate to, some streets, you've heard some names that are here in the community. And again, I think the Charleston had a very wonderful and, and rich history. And one of the things they also say is that you can't have a great city without a great college. And I think that the African Americans were blessed to have had West Virginia State College um, down there. So contributing to the um, middle class, to the um, academicians, the uh, merchants, and uh, professionals as these uh, opportunities opened up. And um, I think about these guys literally you know, every day, and I continue to do uh, research. And next year, so I was driving over here, I was just thinking some numbers in my head. Next year will be the sesquicentennial of the James family in Charleston. So from 1865 to um, 2015. So been around for um, a while. And my only regret was that I, I just did not see how I could stay in the business to do what I wanted to do in Charleston. But I never really planned to leave Charleston, um, but I did. Uh, but I love Charleston, and I love First Baptist Church, and I love my family's roots here, and uh, I love my mother's here. And uh, so that concludes my formal remarks. Yeah, talk about that. Well, there are old timers that say, and there's an article in the Gazette that talked about it, that they remembered seeing these, let's just call it New Orleans style funerals, going up that hill. And they weren't letting them in Spring Hill at the time. Um, although my great grandfather is buried in Spring Hill. Um, but these were it's clearly a black section, and, and they were burying people there. Up in, in, well, you've been up in there, have you? Been? Yeah, go to have access that. Yeah, I mean, it's straight up a hill. It is straight up a hill, and you've seen this obelisk there, but there are a lot of headstones for um, military people. I think there were buried people there through the 40s, some of the stuff that I saw. So I guess that's just where they had their um, burial ground. You know, want to keep it safe, Casey. We don't want to be downtown where people access our stuff. We want to be, you know, up the hill a little bit. Yes, sir. You said your great-grandfather opened his first store on Summer Street. Mm -hmm. Did he not have another store on Fourier Street before the one on Summer Street? If you could prove that to me, I'd be honored. I don't know. And I'll be the first to say I don't know. You think he did? Uh, I thought I read it in your book. No. No? no. I got it, it been, somewhere. It would have been, no, that was on Summer Street, and you can see the signs in, um, yeah, that was, it was, because it's like 16 Summer Street, so it's like right the first block off of the river. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I know he went from a pack peddler to he had his wagons, and so he's there in 1908. He may, I, I will not say that he didn't, um, but I, I don't know that to be a fact. Huh? Read my book? No, I'd love to. Is it, is it available? No, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it because this whole thing about the Underground Railroad and all that kind of stuff goes back to, my father told me, he said, Chuck, I said, yes, Daddy. He says, uh, we were never slaves. I said, really? He said, yeah, we came from Virginia. I said, OK. And he said, we took our name from the James River. We were bondsmen on the James River. That's how we did our stuff. I said, well, Daddy, all you really know is that your grandfather was born in Ohio. You don't know, there's no ties to any of that stuff. But then we subsequently found an obituary from, from how James's wife said, we came to Gilead County from Buckingham County, Virginia in 1836. And then, yes, they were from this town called New Canton. And guess what flows through New Canton? The James River. And guess who all these property owners are? The Jameses here, 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 here. And we can take that back into the early 1700s. So I'm just trying to, so for example, for nine generations straight, none of my direct male forebears have ever worked for anybody. So that's, that's the entrepreneurial tradition in the family. So uh, not to say that some of the other men in the family did not go, but in terms of my straight line, um, that's, that's where that comes from. So, um, so that's my book. So I'm working on that. Oh, I forgot to tell you one more thing. So 
My grandfather, after getting drop kicked in the Great Depression, building this thing up, um, goes, uh, gets a letter from the White House in 1963. And it is an invitation to the Kennedy White House to a steak dinner for the King of Morocco. Now I'm off on the set, on the set how did he get invited to that dinner? Now, for you political historians that know about the Kennedys in West Virginia, John F. Kennedy was a Catholic. A Catholic had never won national office, and Al Smith in 1928 got drop kicked and booted, and they were afraid to even let a um, Catholic run. So when he came to West Virginia, it was like the rock carrying Iowa. <laughs> this ain't South Carolina, boys, this is Iowa. When a Catholic candidate carries backwards, red neck, Scotch, Irish, West Virginians, this boy's got legs. And they used to say in the Kennedy White House, if anybody ever came to him for a favor, they said, well, were they with us before West Virginia? And guess who was campaigning for him in 1960? And guess who was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention in 1960? My grandfather. And, what is, and then they had all, and it's so great, like John Slack, all the names that you all would know that I remember from growing up. And they were saying, I'm, I'm for Humphrey. I'm for, and E.L. James was undecided. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see what's going to happen here. Maybe, maybe LBJ. I don't know. <laughs> see how it goes. So, so again, I just marvel at how he was able to, to make that uh, comeback and from, from truly the depths of, the, of the, um, despair and uh, never face a situation like that. Tennessee, they got those fat. Well, that's because Eastern Tennessee is in the Appalachians, then it smooths the way out. Western Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky is in the hills where they have to live the are, then it smooths the way out. This is the only state that's completely enclosed. There's no flat land. I mean, look at kind of Charleston when you're flying over and getting up the hill, just look, see this, you can see why this valley was settled. So there are some geographic reasons that make it very difficult. But not to say that there can't be other things. I mean, people sitting here for was trying to make it a high-tech hub. I think education is always is always key. Um, but the state has had a very difficult time from absentee landowners from day one extracting the um, the oil and gas and coal and natural gas and um, yeah, that's why companies that's why people are always concerned when the local company sells out to headquarters because they're not giving money back to the community like they are where their headquarters are. And so it's it's a real challenge. I mean, I I, I wish I did know. It is a real challenge, but um, you have states like Tennessee that, is, that are getting into solar energy really big time. They have solar farms and all of this. And it seems that it takes three legs, business, government, and higher ed. Right. They all come right. together That's right. to get a vision about what they want their state to look like, mm -hmm. what they want to begin to pay their people so that you can turn that tax base again. Absolutely. And it seems that we can't get there. And I'm a newcomer <coughs> back to the state. Okay. Yeah. But it seems that we can't really work together. It's always, you know, this you antagonistic know, I'd like to hear what, what Brooks has to say about this as well. So I mentioned to you about know, that Stephen McCabe is writing a book, and it's not a secret because he's getting lectures on it as well, which I came to hear not so long ago. But Charleston one point was a boom town. They, Francis James came to Charleston for a reason. It was popping, it was happening, there was salt mines, there was coal, there was business that was growing, we had the, the river trade going, so for a while it was really doing well there. I mean it was it was amazing. You have people like Mordecai Johnson coming out of here. Do you all know Vernon Johns? Vernon Johns was a minister at First Baptist Church, Six, was the predecessor to Dr. Martin Luther King at the Montgomery Avenue, or whatever, the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. And so they're just national theologians, um, scholars, businessmen, academicians, and these are just the black folks, right? So there was a lot that was going on here, and I, 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 I don't know. Um, 
I think that, um, well, the Walker family would represent part of the, the success, which is the medical center, the medical communities. And so that's an incredible infrastructure. I was on the on board of Children's Hospital in Chicago, and they were kind of in the city, but they're a little north. They said, we're going to build a new hospital. I said, okay, we're going to build. So we're building it right downtown next to Northwestern's hospital and the Rush. And I said, well, it's, you're going to have to go vertical and this and that. And why would you want to do that? Why not just go out in the suburbs and get a big piece of land and just lay everything out? They said, it's all about intellectual brain power, passing people in the hall, going to lunch, bumping into somebody. I'm working on this project. Because what they say is that, there's one book I read one time called Where Good Ideas Come From. The myth of the American tinkerer sitting in his uh, barn building a nuclear bomb doesn't really like, work like that. It's like you learn a little bit here, you learn a little bit from there, and then you piss. Okay, I like what Casey was doing like that. I like Tammy's idea, but I'll take that part. And so it's, it's all, but it's, you have to be around. That's why you get company towns. That's why Detroit was a company town. That's why Wall Street, with all those financiers, are running into each other every day, looking at the deals they did and marginally improving it. So the healthcare, I think, is a good example of something that's very, very positive and being really a regional force in, in health care. Um, but I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, sir. I'm a retired captain of the Charleston Police Department, and I was a young police officer when you were appointed to the Civil Service Commission. Yes, sir. And I just wondered, uh, when you were appointed, is there anything to stand out in your mind uh, that, uh, that you could tell us about doing your tenure on the Civil Service Commission? Well, it's a very interesting world because, see, when I see a man like you and I look in your eyes, I'm like, I don't know what all you've seen because you've seen some bad things and you've seen some bad people when you're enforcing the law. And you literally put your life, as Sean Connery said, the untouchable first job of a cop is to get home alive every day. So when you really meet with the first responders, so to speak, I mean, that, that, there's a level of respect that is just um, there. Um, but then I also found it was very cronyish, and remember Sprad? <coughs> mm -hmm. So there were some clicks. If y'all know who Sprad is, don't worry about it. But there were some clicks, and I think that the, because you were what I would call the first black generation, and my mother's member of the first black generation, and Elliot caught the tail end of the first black generation. You know, his first black to be a manager series. His first black to be vice president. His first first black. So you guys were cracking the integration code and first getting promoted in the police offices and departments. And so things that are a lot different. And matter of fact, I wanted to be a lawyer at one point. And my father said, no, you can't be a lawyer. I said, why not? He says, because you know, the white firms don't hire blacks. And I don't want to see you as some get Joe out of jail on Friday night lawyer. So you go to find something else to do. Elliot on the hand, didn't get that lecture, and he became a partner in one of those common firms in the city. But when I say tail end of the first black generation, you were probably one of the first, if not the first, right, Elliot? Right. So, so, um, so it's 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 um, that that was a kind of a whole different thing. But I, what I really did was walk away with a tremendous amount of respect for the uh, police officers and the jobs that they had daily. But then, what makes it interesting is that. Every office is going to have politics and collectives and factions and this and that. So even though your job is doing this, then you have to still come back to all the all the noise. So I think that I don't know, but I guess what Chucky Green just retired as the fire chief. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's interesting to see how how we kind of continue to, to grow and process. So yes, sir. You've talked about the history of the James Produce Company. Define it now. What's this? What's What's the company like now? Well, we have investments, and uh, I recently sold about 50 Burger King restaurants in Chicago. I had partnered with uh, Goldman Sachs, the investment firm out of New York, where we bought 37 stores and turned them to 48 and sold those. Um, and so um, just looking at some different other options right now. I always say C.H. James Company is a state of mind. So not necessarily limited to. So we went from produce to, when I went to California, we did food processing. So we were doing produce, but it was still on food, but we supplied all the McDonald's in the Western United States with shredded lettuce and things like that, salad mixes in Australia and Asia and things like that. And then I was in distribution, then we bought some restaurants. So I don't know.
organization with the West Virginia Center for African American Architecture. Our board members will be today, our supporters from the Kanawha Valley Historical Preservation Society. To you, the audience, and interested individuals about what we're promoting, it's history. Uh, history is history, like I said. No matter whose it is, we all need to know it. So next time, let's bring some younger people here so they can know it. Six, six o'clock, August 28th, it's Barbara Ann Lacey. I think she has a lot of things to say that I don't know. And I'm interested to find out what they are. I'm sure she has a lot of things to say that you don't know about. I'm sure you want to know what they are too. So come out and be a part of our program next month and the following month. And I'll keep it a secret who's going to be here for September. Okay. And you'll find out if you come next month. So I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate the Archives and History for putting this project on. Mr. Joe Geiger and his staff, uh, City of Charleston, who is helping us with the Block Historic District, and everyone who's a part of it and wants to be interested in what we're doing, support us. Give me a call, 346-6339, Anthony at CACWB.org, or talk with Ms. Club, talk with Casey, talk with Joe Tyree. They can inform you of what we're doing. Without them, I wouldn't be what I'm doing now. And I thank them for helping me get to where I am. Thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, see you next time.